Okay, recording is started. Um, so Dean, uh, I met Dean about, gosh, two months ago now, as we were just getting the Southeast Raleigh Rotary Club started. And um, he stepped up right away to be club treasurer, which was great. Um, and he's helping to get this brand new Southeast Raleigh Rotary Clubs uh, underway, and they're doing a great job. In his professional life, he's Dean and Assistant Professor of the School of Business, Management, and Technology at St. Augs. He also has a very illustrious business um, background, and I actually attended one of their virtual meetings, and he had very interactive presentation talking about his, his business background. Um, he's held executive positions with a number of organizations. And um, he is, has his bachelor's from Tuskegee University. So I'm not going to go into any more detail. If um, Van would like to elaborate, he may. And I think that, um, are you going to be sharing your screen? Or are we just going to hold? Yeah, I'll share, I'll share my screen. I got a few slides prepared. I didn't want to come here empty handed. Uh, let's see here. All right. So uh, thank you guys very much. Um, I'm not, uh, wasn't really sure of uh, the membership makeup. So I decided to, uh, to go to a degustation leadership menu for your uh, for your pleasure here this morning um and um part of the idea was you'll get a little sampling of just a, a few of the concepts i still think are relevant in today's environment uh for uh for leadership as i think i've uh, i've been practicing uh it for mostly 30 years and uh and still a few chapters away in my dissertation from uh, from a terminal degree in the same subject. So uh, so let's get started. But so before we get uh, get going with this, uh, by the way, I'm known for taking a bit a little too far. So this this uh, this whole food degustation bit, we're going to take it all the way to the end, whether it fails or not. So uh, before we uh, we get going, let's set the table a little bit. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit uh, about me. And first, for, for most folks, but now that I'm back in the South, I mean, you can tell I am from the Deep South. So I grew up in Tuskegee, Alabama, the pride of the swift growing South. And um, uh, my, my family I grew up with is at the bottom. And uh, my current family at the top, I'm uh, married, have uh, Three young folks, so so in their uh, in their early twenties, kind of off on their uh, their own careers. Again, I've been doing a whole lot of education. I think um, uh, learning is a lifelong skill, and uh, and I tell folks, uh, hey, if I'm 56 still working on a terminal degree, uh, just about anybody can continue to work uh, on uh, different degrees. I did Marie Marie mentioned, and uh, and I often tell because when when I meet people, they find out I'm the, I'm the dean at St. Augustine's University. I'm not really a traditional educator. Um, I'm a retired business senior executive, and I've worked at uh, a lot of uh, across a lot of brands that uh, most of you probably recognize. And um, I was a senior vice president at a lot of uh, in, in a lot of functions at Pepsi across uh, sales, marketing, and general management, and also worked at Kraft across the Gatorade brands, and in uh, a private company. Spent a lot of time, uh, which I want to get to here in a minute, uh, in my later years across um, um, in terms of development, executive development. So I've been working in organizations and written some uh, some material around uh, development. And then where I'm going to end up down in that, um, that uh, right-hand corner is how I got to SAU. But again, all of these uh, different other organizations, and, it, and it's going to, you don't see uh, Rotary there because I, I, I'm not going to put it up there like I've been in Rotary for, uh, for many, many decades. I think uh, Chalisa and I have been, uh, been in Rotary for all of six weeks. 
but it, it will make it will make the slide uh, one day. But it's been all about service and service above self, and I think that's an important part of leadership. And I'm gonna I'm gonna wind my way uh, down there. So um, uh, about 18 minutes from now, I'm gonna try to land this plane, Marie. And uh, one way or the other, it'll, it'll be a smooth landing, or we'll just come halting down. I got my timer going here, so we'll just uh, we'll continue on. So uh, in a degustation for a menu, if you go to a restaurant, a degustation menu is normally going to be several courses, and it's going to be a taste. The chef is normally prepared something fresh. Uh, so my food for thought for today, for, for your taste, is going to be on several items. We're going to have four quick courses. First one is going to be on leadership versus management. Uh, what's the difference there? I'm also going to end with just a couple of thoughts about a, a crisis. And we've been in a crisis here over the last uh, few months. And also in, in many crises, uh, there are opportunities uh, that exist. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, some of my favorite subjects that, uh, that I do some coursework and, and special uh, speeches on, but how to separate yourself in terms of leadership. And I think emotional intelligence is a very, very powerful way uh, to do that. And then I'm going to end up in talking about leadership, followership, and stewardship. So how do all of those things um, intersect? All right, so here we go. First course, I'm telling, taking this bit all the way. All right, so management and leadership. Uh, one thing that... Um, I didn't think about until I became uh, involved in, in, in a um, PhD program is about the theoretical differences between management and leadership. I'm sure many of us may understand what these concepts and there may be some difference, but there truly are some differences and I see them every day. And what I wanna ask you as you reflect and interact with people that you need both management and leadership. But if I had to tip a balance, I would like to be 30% on the management side, 70% on the leadership side. Because every organization is going to need the management side, which is just how do I plan and budget? How do I organize and staff once I get a group of people? How do I put the, you know, the names in the boxes? You, we also teach in the School of Business uh, controlling uh, and problem solving in which involves some of your finances and some of your accounting. And everybody is striving to get outcomes. We're in leadership. We're starting with establishing direction. You know, I once worked for a, um, a CEO at PepsiCo and his name was Steve Reinemann. And once I went, to, once I asked Steve Reinemann, what is the job of the CEO of a Fortune 50 company? And he told me it was two things. He said it was developing the next leaders for the company. And he told me it was being able to see around the corners. And I thought that was an interesting concept that always stuck with me uh, because being able to see around corners is not easy. And it requires a lot of preparation, a lot of reading, and a lot of talking to people. And part of what uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, here in the next uh, 15 minutes is about the people part, okay? The next thing in leadership is aligning people. And aligning people in the concept of leadership is actually by words. It's not something that you send out. It's not something that you have on a paper. It's actually your words. What words are you saying? What deeds can people see you do that will help you align people? Because what you're doing by your words and your deeds, you're communicating something so that as you move to the management side to put an organized staff, they've been influenced in a certain kind of way right that they believe in what the direction you've already established means 
Okay, so it's very important. The aligning of people is very important in leadership. The next thing is motivating and inspiring. How many of us have all had a, uh, a manager at a job that could not inspire or motivate their pet at home, right? It's the worst thing in the world to go by and just have somebody who's going through the motions of the day. Motivating and inspiring is, is a key element of, of leadership. It's one of the hallmarks, I think, for my career. I've gone into many teams and I've had many team members who were average team members and a leader can take those guys up a few levels uh, to make them believe, drive output, expectations, all right? And it's a very important part of leadership. And then they also drive outcomes. So management, leadership, two different things. I always strive not to be the boss, to be the leader. Now I can be the boss, but I'd rather be uh, the leader in, in most instances, okay? All right, so let's move on. Just a quick bite here. Second course. Let's talk about crisis leadership. We're in a, a, a crisis across, everybody's in this crisis, okay? And typically is the time in a crisis is when you see leaders step up. Now again, leadership and management are two different things, right? So we've just established that. Uh, but it, it's gonna make a really, really big difference on how you uh, approach. On the business side in corporate, as you move up, man, we have a crisis every day. None like the crisis uh, of COVID-19, but there are always plenty of crisis. In fact, uh, I would even argue, there's a lot of business literature that talks about creating disruption inside of organizations to kind of create new innovation. So there are a lot of ways that business actually looks for these opportunities to make it work. So a lot of times, uh, you know, they've got the statements, never let a good crisis go to, worry, go to waste. You ever heard that? Uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. Yeah, huh? you heard, heard of those things? So let's think about that for a second. Let's just say you encountered uh, this particular uh, animal out in the, um, in the wild. I would say that's a pretty good crisis if you came upon this particular alligator. But there's also an opportunity. If you're from the, from the South and most, mostly in Louisiana, I mean, they have a, an opportunity if you survive the crisis to come up with something for, uh, for this particular uh, issue. So there's always an opportunity. When you look at it in terms of scholarship and the field of study and research around those things, I like to look at change management and crisis management is very similar. The difference is in change management, you need to set the, you need to uh, create the sense of urgency and describe what the issue is. In crisis management, we all know what it is. There's a lot of time spent in trying to create a sense of urgency, but we always know what it is. Now, Collar is one of my, uh, one of my favorite um, researchers in change management and, and a lot in leadership. And his premise is, and you can kind of see it today as it plays out in a lot of different venues. He suggests that in any of these uh, particular things, creating a sense of urgency, uh, providing a powerful group of people to kind of get organized. And what he says is top to bottom, right? I used to always say in, um, in PepsiCo, when, uh, when you're at the, when, I, when I'm at the top of the organization, the top 30 of 300,000, we're guiding and moving the organization, but the business is being run by everybody below us. The people who are closest to the customers have all the ideas. They have the best ideas. So when you create these guiding coalitions, you have to have people who actually understand the business, you know, to help develop a, divi uh, uh, a vision. And then you have all the other steps. I'm gonna go into all the other steps, but he suggests that if you fail on any of these steps along the way, you probably won't have a great outcome, okay? 
On the other side, uh, McChrystal, you know, uh, uh, a known general, he's out um, and he has a company that does, all he does is crisis management. And he's got three set steps. He says assess, align, and then act. Inside of his three steps are all these things here, written in a different way. As you guys know, uh, leadership books, they've got, they got them by the thousands. And all we do is repurpose them, right? To resell them or to, uh, to do another $30,000 uh, speech. Uh, at the end of the day, you have to communicate three times normal conditions in crisis leadership. I'm really just surprised across a lot of organizations uh, how much communication is business is normal. It just, it's, uh, it's shocking to me because uh, for crisis management, you really have to understand all the employees, all the people in the organization, where they are, and to make sure you, uh, you understand. All right, moving on. Third course, you see how I'm doing on time. Okay, all right, I'm doing all right. So I said I was gonna talk about the separators. And before I talk about those, which are, are uh, what I think can separate uh, leaders, let me just give you some background. Um, they have this concept called normative leadership styles. And those are really people-focused leadership styles. Have you heard of transformational leadership, perhaps? Yeah? You heard of uh, authentic leadership. Well, I, I've had some, uh, some managers before, um, leaders, leaders, uh, who use these concepts. These are not just concepts you can use because you want to. You can't just declare yourself a transformational leader. You just can't, can't write in your bio that you're an authentic leader. There's a ton of theory and strategy behind all of these things. These are all people focused. These are all, and Rotary, we, we put service before self. These styles put employees and put people before self. You're moving hurdles, elevating people, using charisma, influence to move people, to align people. Um, these aren't theory, they've got theories, expectancy theory, theory X and Y and leadership. The one theory that uh, my students like the often when I talk about theory X, because they sense this theory X is all about that um, people hate work. And uh, so they can relate to that. Yeah, I know, I don't like work, <laughs> but we've all got to move ourselves towards something else. People can enjoy work if they have the right uh, motivation in, in leaders. Okay, so that's one thing I think personally for me uh, that these normative styles of leadership are popular today and they're all people focused. I think you're gonna need that for the next generation of, uh, that are coming behind us, millennials, uh, Zs, whatever generation is gonna grow up behind uh, COVID-19, I think they're gonna need those too. Another concept is difficult to fake uh, leadership, especially in a crisis. That's where you run into trouble. That's why I started you out on that first course. Say management and leadership are two different things, okay? And it's my belief, uh, emotional, emotional intelligence can be learned and applied. So when I'm in class, I always talk to guys that says, hey, when you're born with these fingertips and your fingerprints, ah, you really can't change those. And uh, science says you really can't change your IQ. Emotional intelligence, though, with 21 days of straight application, you can change that. So emotional intelligence is really all about awareness and regard, OK? So it's awareness of self, awareness of others, and regard for self and others. So let me just give you a little hint about uh, regard. So regard, the way we're using it in this term is about concern. Do you have concern for yourself? Do you have concern for others? So when I'm talking about these normative leadership styles, these are all about 
emotional intelligence. You've got to be self-aware and have true concern for yourself and others to be able to lead. All right. Let's go down and talk about what I think are three perfect accoutrements uh, or to separate ourselves. So uh, I thought in, uh, in 30 years, I was going to work, work the word accoutrements into a presentation and I've done it today. So thank you guys very, very, very much. So uh, first thing, you know, I coined and wrote about this term when I was at Pex PepsiCo called business empathy. And when I first uh, wrote about it in a, in a speech, I talked about it in terms of uh, a dad helping one of his kids ride a bicycle. And because um, I think most, most people can relate to this, even as a parent today or when you were a kid, right? So the parent is riding behind, you've got your hand on the back of that seat, but at some point you're gonna have to let that seat go and your kid is gonna have to do it or they're not gonna have to do it. They've got to learn how to ride that bike. You can't help them ride it, but you're gonna help them guide it and they're gonna feel better because they know you're behind them. And so when they start to make that pedal and you release it, they don't know, they can't realize that you've let it go, but they're doing it, okay? One of my concepts in leadership that I use the most is this business empathy. You've got to let team members work their own issues and work their problems. But I will tell you this, it will help if they know you understand what those problems are. I'm not going to do it for you, but it's going to help if they know you know what the problem is. Put it a different way. Take your favorite horror movie. Mine was a nightmare on Elm Street back in the day, right? Let's say you were in that movie and you were walking solo on that street, right? Would you rather, and you knew that Freddy Krueger was gonna come out with those little hand things and you were gonna be dead in moments. Would you rather die alone or would you rather have some company next to you? Of course you would rather have some company next to you, right? So it's, it's a concept where you don't release the problem, but you at least acknowledge you know what it is, okay? I've got some regard for my employee or my, right? Some genuine concern. It's your problem to deal with, but I'm going to acknowledge it. Business empathy. I think it's a powerful, powerful thing. It's a concept that uh, I'm writing more about uh, a little bit later. The other thing is integrity and trust. Uh, I wanted to mention this because uh, integrity and trust is not throwawayable. And we see it all today across the headlines. I used to think in 360 reviews that everybody, when I was in business, got high marks on integrity and trust until I became a senior vice president and I started ranking all of my staff and realized it's very difficult to get those high marks. So always think about integrity and trust. Today, you can always uh, see that it, uh, how important it is. Uh, quickly now, humble confidence is the last uh, of, the, of the three uh, accoutrements I want to talk about. Uh, and I'll just say this, confidence in the two imposters, arrogance and insecurity are, two, are three different things. Humble confidence allows you to know that you, you don't have all the answers. You can bring in teams. You can figure it out. But beware of the imposters of arrogance and insecurity all right it's a whole nother talk for for a day full meal for that one all right fourth fourth uh course and then we'll uh, bring this thing to a halt leadership followership and stewardship who remembers back to their days in college when we did maslow's need hierarchy no doris no jill no Dave, david come on all right very nice thank you all right it's very difficult to get up to that self-actualization, right? You don't, but I don't think you need to be Bill Gates to get up there, right? I think everybody 
can strive to do it. And I think that's what, uh, what's worked for me and how I arrived at um, St. Augustine's, uh, known around town as St. Aug, okay? Uh, one, because after you've had a great career, you've got to evaluate to yourself your balance between take and give, all right? So I'm in my pay it back tour. Of course, St. Aug uh, didn't have the salary to pay me to come down, uh, but it's not about that. So I, I've, I've retired and I was blessed to retire early from, uh, from the corporate life. And so now I'm, uh, I'm trying to give back. My earlier years were spent a lot in children's advocacy. So I was in Make-A-Wish and Junior Achievement in the Breakthrough Collaboration. But now I'm in higher education trying to do uh, some of the same uh, things. Still a people focus uh, business. So I think it lines up fantastically with, uh, with leadership. But when you think about leadership, there's a whole nother branch of scholarship about followership. It's as important as leadership because the follower's job, it's a job, is to make sure the leader is doing what they need to do, right, to be effective. And so part of that is building pipelines of future leaders. So that's what I'm doing at St. Aug. I'm trying to be part in that position to help use some of all the things that I've had in corporate life to balance and move over to help build this, uh, this pipeline. So at Rotary, service above self, it puts us on this whole road to stewardship because stewardship at the end is all about caring, right? So we're back to this whole thing for regard and concern. And so all of these things are, are on a continuum. And, and I think it's one of the things that, uh, that allows us to be great Rotarians, to be great leaders, uh, and also to evaluate where on this continuum, how will you get to your own self-actualization uh, through leadership, followership, and then on to stewardship. All right, let me land this plane. Boom, done. Is that a crash landing? That's crash landing. <laughs> I think I was at my time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, thank you. That was wonderful. Can you unshare your screen? Yes, here we and go. I will make sure to share your contact information. Thank you so much, um, because I would like to share my screen and give you, if I can just find it. We have something special for you, and that is your very own certificate of appreciation. For <laughs> Very nice. attendance here today and I will email that to you and I'll also email, good. Um, your contact information if, in case people would like to get back in touch with you. Um, so what questions do we have? This group is not usually this quiet. Um, you probably need to remind us to unmute. <laughs> well, oh yes, please unmute. And, and or you could um, put uh, your questions in uh, the chat box. So I, uh, as you were speaking, I had a couple of questions. Perhaps you can address this. I know you've been a Rotarian for like two seconds. Yes. But um, how would you see Rotary to use this opportunity? And the other question is just a practical one. Do you have a particular resource that you like for emotional intelligence and how to benefit from those 21 days of becoming um, but more emotionally intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, Rotary is, um, is kind of an intersection of all these things. So um, a, a typical leader would want to try to, because especially normative leadership styles, they're so people focused. It's just a natural thing for 